Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. We've had a great day of meeting with students, chatting at lunch. Thank you so much for your generosity, for uh, listening to us and all of your insightful questions. And we also spent time with students in a class. So it's been a fantastic day for us. And we really appreciate uh, the invitation to be here. And again, all your generosity. So um, a little bit about Charlotte, um, in case you're not familiar with it. We are the 15th uh, largest city in the country. Uh, we've grown exponentially over the past 20 years. The past 10 years, we've had almost a 2% growth rate. Uh, we are in the Piedmont region of North Carolina. We have a pretty young population. Um, and there's a whole smattering of other facts here that um, you can see um, about Charlotte. Um, so today it was interesting because obviously we're here to talk about the Charlotte Future 2040 plan and uh, we haven't done that in a very long time because we have been full steam ahead on the implementation pieces of it. Uh, that's our policy map which was adopted in March of 2022 and then we're in the middle of the community area planning process right now which is creating um, area plans for 14 geographies um, within um, the city of Charlotte. So we will focus on the um, Charlotte Future 2040, but we'll also touch upon those other pieces because they're very important to the story of um, what's happening. A plan isn't any good if you're not implementing it. So backing up a little bit, um, I mentioned that Charlotte is, is growing. We have um, almost a million people now. Um, we have a large land area, 300 square miles. So we've got a million people, but about half the land area that you do here in Philadelphia. And it's also the second largest banking center in the country. So there's a lot of wealth in Charlotte, but unfortunately that wealth has not been equally distributed um, throughout our community um, for, for quite some time. Um, historically, that has resulted in um, a, a really a tale of two cities of have and have nots. And there's a distinct pattern, which we talked about um, in some of the classes or um, with some of the classes earlier today of what we call the arc and the wedge, where um, there's, there's patterns of in disinvestment, investment, wealth and opportunity, and where there is not wealth and opportunity. We also unfortunately have a history of redlining, um, as many other communities do, and that just kind of reinforced um, those inequities. And then in addition to that, our regulations, the zoning ordinance and other regulations um, kind of reinforce those same inequities um, and had both intended and unintended consequences. We also have a history of urban renewal and, and disinvestment in our city center, um, destruction of um, neighborhoods and the neighborhood fabric that um, occurred in many other places in the country in the, in the name of um, progress. And that resulted in disinvestment um, in, in our uptown and kind of the flight out to of investment opportunities away from the city center and into areas um, where they, they move farther and farther from some of our historically black communities. But at the same time, as I mentioned, Charlotte is, is attractive and growing. Um, it has, as I mentioned, a 2% growth rate. We've got a pretty young population um, and we continue to grow. We're attractive to um, other uh, economic development forces. Um, and we knew that if we are going to continue to grow in a um, equitable manner, we needed to do so strategically and intentionally. And in addition to that, I'll mention that we, we had mentioned it earlier today, about 10 years ago when the Chetty Report came out, Charlotte was 50 out of 50 for up, upward mobility. So we knew that we needed an equitable approach that was going to focus on those in our community that um, have been ignored for so long, and we needed a commitment to do that. And that equity included um, meeting people where they are and, um, and, and providing the means that folks need to get access to what they need to um, 
advance in the community. So Charlotte, um, our comprehensive plan, uh, which we'll talk about, is conducted through an equitable equity lens, and it guides our growth and development that we know is coming for the next 20 years. As a first step, we created three key pieces, foundational pieces. Um, instead of doing your um, regular existing conditions report, we looked at our policies, um, what was missing from those policies, our growth factors report, so how we got to where we are, and how that how all of that resulted in the built environment. And obviously community engagement was um, very key to the process and really that, that really involved in talking about who's not in the room and who are we not hearing from and really focusing on that and making in, and having measurable metrics that going back through each phase to determine who are we not reaching why are we not reaching them, and what do we need to change? So as was mentioned in the opening remarks, we had over 40 methods of engagement. You can see there's, there's a wide variety here of traditional and non-traditional methods. We like to say that they're in three buckets of the constant, coordinated, and collaborative. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about um, some of the more um, creative ones. A couple of those were um, gamifying, actually talking about growth and development in Charlotte. So there were two games that were associated with the comprehensive plan. The first one in phase one was a board game that was really a data gathering tool, but we, we had a board game that explored the, the purpose of which sitting down, having folks sitting down together from different communities within their own communities with family members, whoever, and talking about the challenges and opportunities that they're experiencing. So you could have people from, you know, Charlotte, again, is very large land-wise, so we all tend to hover in our little pods. So folks in the north may not, um, north part of our community may not um, even realize that the same challenges exist in the west or the southwest, and talking about those. Um, we had two interns from UNC Chapel Hill that summer that um, the game where we really were focusing on the game and again it was a, a data gathering tool and it was their responsibility to organize game plays, um, collect the data, uh, maintain the game, uh, play the game with folks um, and, and that was really popular. We'd have game sessions with 50 to 100 people. We were able to reach young people, um, all segments of the community. Then in phase three, I believe, we had a card game that we had just uh, gotten back from the printer when COVID hit, and it was, the same, it was the same idea of getting people together to talk about different issues. And this one really focused more on complete communities and the 10-minute neighborhood concept and really educating around that. Um, we had worked in partnership with a local nonprofit um, game organization that hosted a lot of game nights and they helped us design the card game so as soon as you know that wasn't possible any longer uh, they helped us to uh, put it into a virtual format and they hosted game plays for us and so it ended up we reached um, a different segment of the population a much younger segment of the population that which is one of the ones that we do struggle with and um, got a lot of gameplay uh, and um, uh, learning out of that. We also had a robust network of over 400 ambassadors and strategic advisors. So these folks were really charged with being champions of the plan. We age, engaged them on a regular basis in a variety of formats. And their charge also was to go back to their communities and networks and get the word out about the plan and about the um, opportunities and, and bring people with them to the different um, engagement opportunities that we had as well. Um, during the pandemic, as I mentioned, like we had really just hit our stride in having workshops, um, in-person workshops with the community right when uh, COVID hit. And as a lot of other people did, we really had to pivot on that uh, and 
move to the virtual environment, which I think we did pretty successfully, but we knew when the draft plan came out that wasn't really introducing a draft plan in a virtual format, just wasn't gonna cut it. So we organized a drive-in community workshop where there were four sessions where folks could, you know, from their car view different um, boards and information on the plan. And then we had a couple of screens set up where we engaged with folks. We had a presentation and then we engaged using Kahoot with different quizzes and questions and things like that. Um, and at the end of the night, we showed the movie Back to the Future. So all of these things that we heard from the community kind of dis distilled down into the themes of neighborhoods, mobility, uh, environmental resiliency, and economic um, resiliency as well. And all of those fed into the goals that you'll find within the plan that Jay will talk about in a minute. And I'll turn it over to him to um, talk about the equitable growth framework and get, dive down into the plan a little bit more. Great. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, yeah, so there's quite a bit of content in the plan. Um, I get the pleasure of talking about that piece. Uh, it's actually three volumes, uh, the plan, if you look online. Uh, so there's the policy plan, uh, is sort of how we organize this, sort of the, uh, all, everything you can see on the screen here, really, and I'll go over in just a second. Um, there's then uh, an impl implementation strategy, specifically, this is volume two, uh, and then manuals and metrics is the volume three piece. So the equitable growth framework, um, in a way we do consider all of this part of the equitable growth framework, but really it's sort of the over, you could kind of turn this on its side. It would be the umbrella over everything. The idea was that we wanted to approach the work in a different way. Um, and I think a few years ago, the idea of having a more equitable plan uh, was really focused on having more inclusionary public engagement. Um, and we, we were dedicated to that, as Kathy had talked about. But we were also really wanting to kind of think about the methodology of the plan, uh, think about the recommendations of the plan. Uh, and so really took a st step back and thought about how do we approach each of those things. So the equitable growth, growth framework then was this overarching umbrella over the vision, the goals and policies, implementation, and then the different components you see there on the right as well. Uh, but specifically, the equitable growth framework uh, was intended to answer some big questions. Um, Kathy talked about the disparities uh, over decades and decades, really over a century uh, in Charlotte, and the implications that that had for people um, across the city, particularly in that sort of arc or crescent and wedge um, kind of geography. And what we were looking at was kind of thinking about what are the greatest issues and needs in different areas and understanding that that's different. It's not a one size fits all uh, kind of solution across the city. Um, how and where to prioritize limited resources. Uh, so we had different tools and, and methodologies around that. Um, and then how to ensure costs and benefits are more equitably distributed as well. Um, so that um, things like, I mean, in the extreme example, urban renewal, uh, those costs were all borne by uh, kind of lower income black communities primarily in the case of the Brooklyn neighborhood in Uptown. Um, and so, uh, and no benefit to them really. It was kind of benefit to uh, the downtown office worker, um, you know, the more affluent white community. And so we wanted to think also about, you know, how do we anticipate as much as we can those unintended consequences? Um, and uh, really distribute those costs and benefits more evenly. And so we developed, uh, and this was informed by work that was being done in Seattle, um, work that was done in Denver at the time, um, some work that was being done uh, locally in Charlotte, um, but looked at uh, locations where there was vulnerability, vulnerability, vulnerability to displacement and uh, what those contributing factors were. So race, age, income, education level. And that really, that, that pattern on the top here, um, that's really sort of demonstrating that uh, crescent and wedge pattern, right? So the blues and the greens uh, were those areas that were more vulnerable to displacement. Uh, the yellows were less vulnerable. Um, then we started to think about, okay, well, what are the opportunities that we can influence with a comprehensive plan and we thought about uh, access to amenities, goods, and services. So can people get what they need uh, nearby uh, to their neighborhoods? 
um, or are they having to travel across the city? Um, and you know, they're already having this undue burden, uh, and then the extra burden of transportation costs on top of that potentially. Access to housing opportunity, uh, which we looked at um, different types of housing and looked at really places that were overly homogenous uh, with maybe it was a single family detached you know, home neighborhood um, and they had no other options. Um, and then we also looked at places where it was kind of flipped on the other side, where it's only multifamily housing uh, but no other options or maybe it's only rentals. And so we're looking at um, homogeneity and how do we in introduce more diversity um, not only in the product, but also in the pricing of housing. And then access to employment opportunity. Uh, so that was looking at how do people get around um, and thinking about sort of the distance traveled uh, and getting uh, to different types of employment. And we looked at different uh, income levels across that. And finally, environmental justice, uh, which is really the pairing of those sort of risk factors, the demographics around vulner vulnerability to displacement, um, and pairing that with some of the environmental indicators. Uh, we looked at noise, pollution, um, uh, floodplain issues, and things like that as well. And so uh, we mapped all of that, and then it was like, okay, what do we do with this information? Uh, it was, you know, we did those three upfront uh, sort of existing conditions reports. We sort of developed this fuller methodology you know, around the equitable growth, growth framework in response to what we were hearing from the community. Um, but then we had to actually come up with goals and recommendations. And so that brought us to the 10 goals of the plan. And uh, if you're familiar with comprehensive planning, which probably everyone in the room is, uh, you know that typically those are you know, organized around plan elements, which are topical. So you end up with a land use element and a housing element, economic development element, a transportation element. And while you see some vestiges of that, I think, in the goals, we really tried to um, a term I've heard lately and I love is smurge uh, some of that together. Um, so thinking about uh, 10 minute neighborhoods, there's an aspect of that of land use planning, of course, uh, making sure that people have goods and services and amenities uh, near them, but also there's a transportation aspect. How are they getting there? Do they have the connections? Does it feel safe and comfortable? Um, similarly, neighborhood diversity and inclusion and housing access for all. The housing piece was so critical the crisis was so great that we actually created two goals around that, one around affordability and one around diversity. Um, transit and trail-oriented development, or as I called it affectionately, uh, 2TOD. Um, so thinking about um, traditional transit-oriented development, but also trail-oriented development, which there's a really great network and growing network of greenways and trails around Charlotte, and thinking about those being amenities, not only for recreation, but for transportation and placemaking. Um, safe and equitable mobility was a key piece, and there were actually concurrent planning efforts going on uh, while we were developing the comprehensive plan, which was really challenging in many ways, but also really advantageous. So there was a, a multimodal strategic plan being developed, uh, so we worked really closely on this goal and strategies with that uh, team. Um, and there was also um, a parks plan being developed. Um, there was a, a Bloomberg uh, climate uh, action strategy, um, the tree canopy master plan. So there's a, a whole host, of, I'm probably forgetting some things too, but a whole host of efforts uh, that were being coordinated. Um, the healthy and safe, uh, our healthy, safe, and active communities is just what it says, I think, um, similar to integrated natural and built environment. All of that was really key. People were seeing, feeling, it was really hard for people to kind of think about the future of the city and what they wanted to look like when they were feeling sort of overrun by development uh, in the moment. Um, this is in 2018, 2019, uh, kind of wrapped up the development recommendations in 2020. And so uh, it was, we were trying to relate to people um, and really thinking about how can the additional investment, both public and private, not only benefit those new residents, the new areas of town, but the existing districts, neighborhoods, corridors. Um, and that resonated pretty well, and uh, we were able to kind of have uh, frank conversations around that, um, which is related to the diverse and resilient economic opportunity. Um, there's this idea of retaining our identity and charm, and we wanted to be really careful. Uh, we've worked on plans where uh, community character, or charm in this case, which is a little more of the southern twist on it, I'd say, um, has been used as a shield and a sword, you know, sort of combating 
new investment uh, change in a neighborhood uh, for the sake of preservation, for the sake of maintaining our character. We don't want anyone else coming here. I may, may have moved here two years ago, but now we want to you know, kind of close the gates. Uh, and so there was an aspect of what is contributory to charm and character. And then finally, fiscal responsibility was a key piece, particularly for council, um, but I think it was important to the staff uh, and the community as well. Uh, so there was a lot of work done by one of our partners, Economic and Planning Systems, on the uh, cost benefit, market feasibility, fiscal impact of individual place types, which I'll get to in a second, um, as well as the overall concept for growth in Charlotte moving forward, making sure that the city didn't in turn get upside down, so to speak, where the cost of development, cost of serving new development, was actually uh, greater than the revenue that would be generated by that new development through taxation, other fees and purpose or uh, mechanisms. So I just mentioned place types. Um, I mentioned design and character. So this was really our opportunity to kind of dive into this. And um, frankly, when the when the city issued its RFP, uh, it was one of the things that really jumped out at me. Uh, was that they had already been working on place types and wanted to see that integrated into the planning process. It was something that we had been doing in a couple of other communities, San Antonio and Denver, um, probably most notably. Uh, and so sort of this idea of advancing beyond just a policy document and integrating physical planning and urban design um, and um, into the planning process and into the tools that would be generated by the plan was um, kind of near and dear to my heart. And so, if you're not familiar with the place types approach, in essence, most comprehensive plans have a future land use map. It's kind of the paint by color or paint by number, you know, map of future land use. Uh, pretty prescriptive, um, and usually dictating a singular land use for each parcel. Um, so a couple things are happening. One, very little flexibility with that approach. Um, it's you know focused on one land use typically. Um, or you end up with a map that's all the mixed use color, which isn't that helpful either. Um, two, the scale, uh, really focused on individual parcels and with no real mechanism, mechanism to ensure that all the pieces add up to something you know, greater than the sum of its parts. So um, what we started to think about was neighborhoods and districts and corridors and, and places ultimately, the way that people want to experience a community and um, I think the elements of our built environment that contribute to memory and emotion um, and the attachment to place. Um, and so we broke that down because we're planners. We had to break it into elements. So uh, land use, character, mobility, building design, and open space. And we developed a palette of 10 place types. Uh, each place type has multiple uses within it. Um, and each, even, even those that are probably most homogeneous uh, parks and preserves, neighborhood one being kind of the lower density neighborhoods, still had a mix of uses uh, encouraged within them. Um, but we also went beyond that and thought about what parks and open space, trails and greenways were necessary to support each of these places. Uh, with what transportation, mobility options were necessary uh, to support these places. And then how do they relate to each other? A uh, really important piece as well. So. Uh, we broke that down into live, work, and play. Uh, so there's the parks and preserves, neighborhood one, neighborhood two in the live category. Work includes the commercial campus. Uh, we have the innovation mixed use and manufacturing logistics in our work category. Um, and then we had three scales of mixed use centers uh, or activity centers. Uh, so neighborhood, community, and regional. And for each of those, and I, I'm not going to make you look at each one, so I just have one as an example here. Um, but for each of those, we did a deep dive, and, and the city staff had done a ton of legwork on this already. Uh, so we really helped to refine that and visualize that. Um, but as far as the specific parameters, um, it, a lot of that was developed and then sort of refined through the process. Um, and the comprehensive plan and the visioning provided that context for the community to have this conversation um, around the places that they wanted to see, uh, what were the different uh, components of a place as well as the set of places that would make a complete community. Um, and then we were able to um, sort of uh, codify that in the plan. So each place type um, sort of 
dived in and it had uh, these different parameters. On this screen you can see land use, character, mobility, building form. Uh, we did modeling of what that looked like based on based on real places. It was kind of like a Law and Order episode, if you remember that one. Uh, but you know, kind of based on true events. But then we changed a few of the details, uh, so no one knew exactly where it was. Uh, but tried to. I, I mean, that was actually really important. I, I, you know, joke about that, but it was important because Charlotte is is unique in terms of its topography, uh, in terms of the road network. It's not a grid. Um, with the exception of you know pieces of uptown, um, you know it's more of a radial pattern and kind of driven by the topography, um, natural uh, greenway system, uh, riparian system. Um, we looked at the transition from one place to another and tried to uh, identify uh, tools and strategies around that. Uh, used examples from the community so people could understand what's you know some of this looked like. Uh, what were more desirable uh, types of development that fit within each place. Um, went even deeper into some of the aspects of, in, in particular, uh, I would say in coordination with some of these other plans like the urban forest, um, thinking about building placement, parking strategies, um, as well as access, curb lane management, you know, transportation demand management. Um, something, I mean, I guess the thing that I point out here is a future, I've never seen a future land use map or a land use element get into some of these details, but these were the very same details that people were complaining about, you know, in terms of new development where, you know, what the parking wasn't being provided, the, trans, the access to get to a place wasn't being thought about um, as this new development came in and there's an impact on my neighborhood. Um, and so place types and the overall work that the city and our consultant team did um, help to frame that appropriately. I mentioned transitions and the adjacencies between place types uh, several times, but that was a critical component, was thinking about uh, where were certain place type adjacencies appropriate and how did we transition? Because that, in fact, when I talk about the community being upset about new development, that was a lot of it. There was the character and charm. They were thinking that some of the development may not be of the right quality. But then they were also thinking about the transitions from an existing place, typically their neighborhood, uh, but not always. Sometimes it was where they were working or a campus um, or maybe their favorite park and how that transitioned to that new development. So we looked at different parameters around that, looked at preferred adjacencies, looked at additional tools when you had an uh, undesirable sort of adjacency, maybe because of the existing development pattern, uh, what were strategies around that. Um, and uh, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kathy for a couple of slides. So at the same time that um, we were doing the comprehensive plan, we were also uh, developing a unified development ordinance and rewriting our zoning ordinance. So uh, we knew that both our policies and the regulations that we had were outdated, especially for where, where our community was um, in its stage of growth and development. And this was also a real opportunity to better align our policies and our, and our regulations. So Jay mentioned the place types. We had like some, something like 80 something different land use categories on our um, future land use map, which as he mentioned, really told you nothing. Um, and it was kind of on a place by, you know, parcel by parcel basis. Um, place types are intended to be applied at the block level. And then from the regulatory standpoint, it was a great opportunity for us to um, design the zoning districts that would implement those place types and have a limited menu of districts that is specifically designed to implement that place type. So that was um, a real opportunity for us and something that our uh, zoning ordinance and our unified development ordinance was adopted in I think August of 2022. So we're, we're really um, still working through that, that um, interim period, but it is something that really provides, as we were talking about earlier today, much more clarity for the developer Everybody just know, wants to know what's the rules of the game. The developers want to know that. The residents want to know what can I expect um, future development to be. And our elected officials want to know those same things too. 
The other thing I would mention is that um, place types are also, cons and the growth projections that we use and the um, comprehensive plan that, that we've planned around and in our policy map, they're consistent from a regional perspective. So um, I think different from in the Northeast, our uh, metropolitan planning organization is housed in um, our planning department, and they work closely with um, the Central Line of Council of Government on those regional growth projections. And so in 2015, um, Central Line had a 14 county uh, plan called Connect Our Future that used place types. And obviously, because it's a much bigger region and um, much of it is rural, much of it is small towns. The place type palette is, is much bigger than our 10. But that was our starting point, is that very large palette, and then kind of um, distilling that down into what made sense for Charlotte. But ultimately, our place type palette rolls back up into that, that larger one. And then from um, a regional planning perspective, that's very helpful. And also um, in terms of the growth projections as well. Great. Uh, so we wanted to hit on the other two pieces uh, that Kathy talked about. I'll try to pick up my pace. I realize I get excited about this stuff and go on and on. So, um, <clears throat> so the policy map, um, it was kind of interesting during the planning process, we actually had a change of uh, project management um, on the city side and on the consultant side actually, but it was probably more impactful on the city side. The project manager that came in midway through the process, uh, you know, sort of put the project on hold-ish, you know, for like a month or so to kind of wrap their head around it. And ultimately she decided, um, I think there was probably a few tweaks, but the most influential thing was that she said, we're not gonna have a map in the plan. And we said, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> we have to have a map in the plan. Um, and basically sort of broke it into two pieces. So there was the policy plan that I talked about, um, along with the additional volumes. And then there was the policy map. Um, and the thought, um, which I think ultimately worked out really well, was if we can get everyone to agree on the, the place type palette, the goals, the equitable growth framework, which are all you know, very different uh, than the policy direction that exists already, um, well then let's get that agreement, get that adopted, and then we'll work on the, the mapping, because that's gonna be its own can of worms. And so, uh, that happened sort of immediately after adoption. That kicked off, it was about a nine month process of the policy mapping. Um, concurrently, uh, there was the UDO work uh, that Kathy just talked about, which is the Unified Development Ordinance, uh, which it had been, you can't, especially the scale of, and transformation of that code, you couldn't do that in a year. Um, so that was happening kind of concurrently with the comprehensive plan, which again, presented some challenges, but ultimately I think allowed for adoption of the UDO in a really timely manner uh, following plan adoption. And then there was the strategic mobility plan that I mentioned before as well. Um, so translating the, the place types, the policies, I asked before, or I sort of rhetorically said, well, what do we do with this information from the equitable growth framework? Uh, well, there was a whole host of policies in the plan, which we didn't want to bore you with this evening. Um, but uh, I think the other piece was using it to inform the mapping. So uh, when we looked at the mapping, uh, a key piece of that was integrating, I'll move forward here, integrating the equitable growth framework. And so, uh, and it was necessary as a bridge between the, the policy direction and the vision articulated in the comprehensive plan and ultimately the zoning code, because uh, the UDO, Unified Development Ordinance and the zoning code and everything else that was in there, it needed a map as well. And so, the policy map, uh, the mapping of place types was that bridge to a new zoning map. Uh, and so there was a whole host of outreach here, uh, which also sort of was led by that collaborative, coordinated, constant uh, kind of framework that, that Kathy talked about. What our approach was, was to kind of develop a methodology that was highly defensible. <laughs> um, you know, it's kind of our first step. So we looked at existing zoning um, and what direction that provided. We looked at uh, adopted uh, plans that had a land use component to them, primarily neighborhood plans uh, of different types or corridor plans. 
Um, and then we looked at the equitable growth framework and what did that uh, tell us about where there were needs for additional housing diversity uh, or additional employment opportunities. Uh, and all of that was sort of was melded together uh, through that community process uh, in developing the, the map. Um, so we developed a, an initial draft that was all uh, methodology based. Uh, there was no sort of judgment, subjectivity applied to that beyond some of the rules and tools that we developed in doing the mapping. Um, one of those was uh, looking at patterns. Uh, I mentioned the adjacencies. And so we analyzed the policies within the plan, which of those had a physical implication and could be translated to mapping of place types, and came up with a bunch of patterns around that. Um, that methodology, as I mentioned, we looked at existing place types first. So we mapped the entire city, existing land use through that kind of place type lens. And so we created that, which has been really helpful in some of the current work where we're looking at you know, the type of change or the magnitude of change that we're expecting in different areas. And then we mapped the status quo, which uh, was, as I mentioned, adopted area plans. Um, and then ultimately um, mapped the equitable growth framework on top of that. So adjusted some of the existing policy direction or existing place types uh, based on that. The final map looks like, there we go, uh, looks like that. Um, and there were some pretty sizable shifts in where the existing, or sorry, the projected jobs and housing units were going to be accommodated moving forward. So while there's still a very large, and you can see the highlighted number there, um, 72,000, 72 you know, new residential units in neighborhood one, which would be more like the traditional, you know, single family detached neighborhoods, although uh, we had, uh, through the policy work, um, actually um, sort of done away with uh, single family uh, detached only zoning. Um, it was uh, a lot of that housing and, and jobs was actually shifted to other uh, areas, including the higher density neighborhoods and importantly, those mixed use activity centers, neighborhood, community, and regional. Uh, we documented all this. Um, there's a there's an internal version which has some things like terms like hodgepodge in there and things that Kathy and I remember affectionately. But, but we created a public facing uh, manual, one, to make sure that this was replicable um, you know, for 10 years, 20 years down the road uh, when this work is being done again, uh, but also to make it really accessible and understandable to the general public. So um, if you take a look at the policy map manual, um, it's available online. Uh, there's even um, sort of a comic strip kind of component of that, trying to make it really um, easy to understand and, and what does it mean for you as a resident versus a developer versus an elected official. Um, so all those different pieces. And then um, I think the last thing I'll say on the policy mapping uh, is that uh, we just had, it is, a as I mentioned, the bridge. So there was the policy uh, written in the plan. The place types were a physical expression of the policy to some extent, um, but ultimately it was the mapping of those that led to the real change, right? There's the policy and the regulation, and so it created that opportunity to uh, update the zoning code uh, through the map, not just through the words. So I mentioned our other implementation item, which is community area planning, which we are about halfway through with now. Um, so the, the comprehensive plan sets, off, sets out a plan hierarchy. So the comprehensive plan is your umbrella document. And then there's tiered plans. So uh, today we were talking about corridors of opportunity. That would be a specific plan. That would be on the bottom rung. Um, second tier would be um, a strategic plan, like the strategic mobility plan. The third tier of guidance is community area plans. And community area planning, we're actually doing 14 community area plans over a two year period. And as I mentioned, we're about halfway through the process, which is really kind of crazy. Um, and probably why we haven't done the comprehensive plan presentation in so long, because as I mentioned, we're just like full blast on foot on the gas on everything else. Um, but it takes the goals of the conference, goals and objectives in the comprehensive plan and brings them down to um, the community level. So we have the community broken into 14 planning geographies. Um, they're larger than maybe you would think for a small area plan or what we have done in the past. But 
it's nice because it really fosters that conversation among neighborhoods and helping folks again to look at uh, issues that might be happening in one part of the community are the same in others and the solutions should be um, the same as well. Um, it's also efficient in terms of bringing the whole community up to the same level of guidance um, at one time so that no part of the community is waiting to um, be caught up to where everyone else is. And finally, um, it's efficient in terms of it helps us. We're, we're coming up on now almost needing an assess the assessment for the comprehensive plan, and there may need to be some citywide policy updates. So it really helps us kind of hone in on that as well. This is kind of a sneak peek of what that will look like. Um, our, our city council is, is wanting to know because they're very afraid of getting 14 plans. But there will be one guide um, that will uh, apply to all of the plans um, that will kind of lay out the overview and, and um, glossary of terms and all those kinds of things. And then the 14 plans will be um, slim documents. We're thinking no more than 50 pages and highly illustrative. And you can kind of see what some of the contents of, of that are. So it's a five phase process. Uh, phase one was setting the stage. So that's really like the existing conditions. So looking at each of the geographies and determining um, what the greatest needs is what the greatest needs are in terms of access to housing, jobs, goods, and services, comparing that to citywide. And then the result of that was 14 community reports, which are available on our website and that we encourage folks to take a look at before they, they come to workshops um, to learn a little bit more about their area. Phase two focused on tweaks and updates to the policy map for greater accuracy. So the policy map um, uh, project that, or uh, process that Jay described, that was mapping over 300,000 parcels, um, over, you know, 300 plus square miles. So we were pretty sure that there were areas that we could have made a decision one way or another and that we could improve the accuracy of the map. Um, so we had assumed on our side that that would be about a 20% change. Um, phase two really focused with the community. We had different focus areas where we talked about um, some of the patterns that Jay described and where um, there was misalignment there and, and what the community's thoughts are. The goals in the plan sometimes compete as well, so kind of reaffirming some of that. Um, we wrapped up that work and re released the revised policy map, which is available on our website, so you can look at the adopted and the revised, and that'll all um, go to council um, next year. Phase three, which we're in the middle of right now, focuses on projects and programs because we know that it's not just the built form. There's other um, infrastructure and capital investments that need to happen. So we're having those conversations with the community right now. We're wrapping up our, our last um, set of workshops the middle of next month. And all the while, um, phase four focuses on documenting this process and actually writing the plan and creating an implementation strategy, but we're working on that right now because as we talked about earlier, the plans are not really like some great unveiling of something that folks haven't seen before. We This is all the work that we've been doing um, in phase one, two, and three and just documenting it. And then phase five will be review and adoption. So our goal is to have the draft plans released March 3rd and then we'll begin review and adoption and hopefully have it adopted. Um, our goal would be April. Um, we've talked numerous times about the constant co coordinated and collaborative buckets of engagement. So a lot of bad things happened out of COVID, but one good thing for us was that we really upped our game on the constant tactics that we have. Um, folks being able to comment on maps online. We have a great web tool that's associated with phase three and we, we hope you'll check that out. Um, really using story maps and um, giving, giving folks access 24-7. Um, back to the in-person workshop, so this says 42, or we'll be up to um, 50, I think, now, and, and um, over 500 participants um, and, you know, over 1,000 comments. Um, and you can see the other things that we did as well. We also added in this phase, um, Based on, as Jay mentioned, the Equity Atlas helped us determine the segments of the population that we weren't reaching. And then this past summer, we had a couple of 
uh, an intern from Davidson who took that work and kind of developed a database for us, which we then have shared with other departments and other organizations for their planning efforts. So, and we also partnered with two um, UNC Charlotte professors that were doing urban heat mapping work, and they um, uh, had four focus groups for us, three of them in Spanish and three of them in English, and they were able to use uh, the input from those workshops in their work, and we were able to use them in ours. And then um, we've talked a lot about that, keeping it equitable and inclusive, and you can see um, that we've had a whole host of interactions with folks. And, you know, ultimately all of this is uh, leading to community-driven um, revisions, and we'll, we'll um, keep doing that as we continue to implement the plan. And one piece of that that you can see now is um, in the revised policy map with those changes. And finally, what happens after adoption and continuing to implement? Well, that's, um, that's not just um, the public sector. Obviously, we talked about this earlier today, too. There's capital investments that are needed that, on the city side, but there's also public-private partnerships. A lot of development happens through the private sector, um, and a lot of it happens through the rezoning process as well. And the zoning map that Jay talked about that is associated with our revised zoning ordinance in the UDO. So with that, thank you again for having us. Um, we really appreciate it, and thank you for the award and taking the time um, to listen to us tonight. Well, uh, um, thank you, uh, Kathy, Jay. Um, it's uh, clear that we have uh, a lot to learn from Charlotte. So I encourage um, everyone to uh, consult the web page, uh, which is cltfuture2040.com. Um, for me, there's a couple of takeaways. One, uh, the emphasis uh, on equity um, and addressing the, the social equity in, in Charlotte. Uh, having gone, uh, having been very involved in the uh, city of Austin's uh, comprehensive plan and where community engagement is a contact sport. Uh, I, can, I can just imagine what community engagement during a pandemic must have been like. But uh, what's impressive is the adaptation and, and the new tools that have emerged. Um, also, um, uh, I think there's a kind of a quiet revolution in zoning going on in, in the United States in the moment, and Charlotte has been at the forefront of that. Uh, I can't uh, not take an opportunity to, to recommend uh, Sarah Bronlin's uh, incredible new book, Key to the City, which is uh, a call to action around zoning um, and sort of documents a lot of the changes that are happening nationwide. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that tonight's event is part of a double header. Um, unfortunately, not a double header that the Philadelphia team will be taking any part of. Um, on Wednesday, January 22nd, we'll be back here to honor the Tokyo based architecture firm Sauna, and they're the winner of our 2024 Cantor Trish uh, Medal in Architecture, which is the companion medal. Uh, so that's January 22nd, so mark it on the calendar. Uh, in the meantime, please uh, uh, enjoy uh, the reception at the back of the room, and I would ask the medal winners and Megan and Bill to come up for a photo op in the, in the front of the room. So thank you all for being here. <laughs>